Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, OT Rex. Today we're going to be covering Huntington's disease, also known as HD. Let's go ahead and jump into it. What is Huntington's disease? Huntington's disease is a genetic hereditary neurological disorder, and it is caused by a defective gene on chromosome four. And what happens is your physical and your mental abilities are highly impacted. This includes your motor coordination and balance for your physical ability, as well as your mood, memory, and thinking for your mental ability. Before we dive into the symptoms, let's go over our anatomy, which I love to do. The impacted areas of the brain with Huntington's disease is in the basal ganglia and the cerebral cortex. As some of you are, might already know, these two areas of the brain work very closely together. So our basal ganglia is in charge of our motor control, motor learning, emotion, and behaviors, and our cerebral cortex is in charge of attention, thought, memory, and in language. So I really like this little picture. Alrighty, so now we can move on to the symptoms. So usually Huntington's will develop between the age range of 30 to 50. Of course, it can happen earlier or later, but this is kind of the prime window. And it is a slow progression for 15 to 20 years from onset. It's going to lead to uncontrollable movements of the limbs and several other brain changes, as we spoke about earlier, that will impact your mood, especially depression, irritability, anxiety, as well as obsessive compulsive qualities. It's important to understand the motor difficulties because the terms here are very common to Huntington's, especially number one. So let's go over that in a little more detail. So chorea or choreiform are characterized as rapid, irregular, involuntary movements. Also looks like muscle jerks. And this one is a really key motor difficulty. When you think of Huntington's, you want to think chorea because they are highly associated to each other. I have a super strange mnemonic device for this, and it's actually not even mine. It was a colleague of mine during grad school, and I will forever remember this for some reason, when we learned about Korea, she automatically started talking about how it made her think of the country, South Korea, and then she started talking about K-pop, which is short for Korean pop music if you're not familiar with it. And if you have ever seen any K-pop music video, they have some very rigorous and rapid dance choreography. So. Now I just think of my friend flailing her arms irregularly and rapidly and talking about how Korea made her associated to South Korea and to K-pop and these very rapid, irregular, like muscle-based dance movements. So I don't know if that's going to help you remember, but I wanted to share because it's super silly and it helped me remember for years on end. The second motor difficulty is akathisia. And this one is characterized by restlessness or fidgety behavior. And the third one is dystonia, which is abnormal sustained posture and muscle spasms basically that can occur throughout the body. And there's a big trend here, as you can see, if you have irregular involuntary movements, then it makes sense that the person with Huntington's is gonna be more restless and fidgety because they don't have full control over their motor coordination and that that's going to impact their posture as well as their tone. So that all comes together and we're going to see how that's going to impact the person in these stages of Huntington's disease. My intention of sharing these stages with you is not for you to sit there and try to memorize, oh, stage one, zero to eight years. That's not what I think is uh, going to be beneficial for you. I think understanding the trend and the progression of what a person is able to do in the early stage versus the mid stage versus the late stage is more important, especially as OTs, because you will see exactly how much help they might need with their activities of daily living. So just hang with me here, but I will wrap it up in a brief overview after we cover the five stages. So stage one is zero to eight years from onset, and a person is still working at this point. They might be working part-time, and they might need some minimal assistance with some of their ADL. At stage two, this is three to 15 years from onset, 
and typically they're not able to work at this point. So we've already made a jump here from working to not working. And you can see that their basic functions are more impacted. Either you will find that the person needs minimal assistance in their ADL across the board, or you might find that one area is highly impacted, so they might need maximum assistance in one area, and then they're more independent in the others. Stage three is five to 16 years from onset, and they are unable to work, as I mentioned earlier, and they're at maximum assistance for most ADL at this point. So stage three would be mid-stage. Stage four is nine to 21 years from onset. They are at maximum assistance, not just for activities of daily living, but also for IADL, which is going to include things like transportation, driving, meal prep, and some of the more complex activities um, like shopping and finances. So at this point, this individual is going to need in-home care or extended care facility support. And we are at our last stage. Stage five is 11 to 26 years from onset. And at this point, they need full-time skilled nursing facility support. In the later stages of Huntington's disease, I also want to note that chorea will develop into hypertonicity. And you also have characteristics like very slow movement, also known as bradykinesia and akinesia, which think about medical terminology, A is the absence of or lack of, and kinesia has to do with our movement because of the kin. So if you have akinesia, you are going to have delayed initiation of movement. So let's do a wrap up just like I said I would. Our early stage people are still working, but they're having a little more difficulty maintaining their work performance and that's gonna get a little harder. By mid stage, if you remember stage three, the individual is not able to work anymore and they're at maximum assistance. So at this point, our cognition and our gait decrease as well as our de decision making, memory and motor coordination slash balance. Late stage, remember at stage five, we are in long-term care or hospitalization. In addition to this, an individual with Huntington's disease will also be impacted in other muscle areas of the body. So dysarthria refers to a speech disorder. So the person may not be able to speak later into the progression of their conditions. And dysphagia, which is referring to swallowing difficulties. So they might need intervention for that as well, or a change in their diet plan and to make sure that they can eat um, in a safe way and get their nutrition intake. You also see depression and there is a high susceptibility to pneumonia and some other conditions as well, but you have to think the body is a lot more compromised at this point, so other um, comorbidities are more likely to occur easily like pneumonia. Okay, so now that we've talked about all of the symptoms, I want to wrap this up by talking about how we can remember Huntington's disease. I always find that the conditions that are named after the, the doctor or like the researcher who discovered it, which is the case for Huntington's, is always harder to remember because they're just random last names. So I like to think about hunting and the skill sets that are required to go hunting effectively. So when someone is hunting, there is a lot of controlled motor coordination and balance involved because you have to be very stealthy and quick on your toes, but you also have to be very good at thinking and reasoning and problem solving to hunt effectively because if you're you know chasing after a fast animal you have to be one step ahead of them and plan this whole thing out right so those are all skills that are impacted by Huntington's disease since this condition is hereditary it is really important to understand um, how your genes are going to be impacted within a family and you can get a consultation on that and get genetic testing Unfortunately, since there is no cure, we have to look at appropriate medication as well as treatments that focus on managing symptoms as Huntington's cannot be slowed down. So as OTs, what do you think we're going to be working on with our um, patients? We will be working on environmental modification, safety and fall education is really important. Energy conservation is always a big one because if their motor abilities are delayed or highly impacted, you want to simplify tasks. You want to really help uh, decrease the daily demands 
by breaking up tasks or figure out where you can position things. And this ties back in with environmental modification, where can you place necessities that you use often in close proximities? Where can you move products where if there are items very high up in or in areas that are difficult to reach, you want to bring them down to a more accessible place. Um, cognitive strategies are also very important due to the memory that is impacted. So simple steps using lists, calendars, and labels are all helpful strategies. Adaptive equipment is really effective as well to support meal time and fine motor skills and just daily living skills in general. In addition to that, anti-contracture splints as well as education in the later stages of Huntington's is important so that people know how to avoid contractures or even just education to their caregivers on how to you know, appropriately set them up in bed or uh, have a schedule to you know, turn on different sides so that they're not always um, in a position that can cause a contracture. All of that's really important. Uh, assisting the patient with coping strategies is also a really big one. And you want to think about, especially the patients who are in the earlier stages who might still be working or really want to work because work is a very fulfilling occupation. So if that is their situation, then you really want to help them in assessing if it's still safe for them to drive or, or how they can access transportation effectively if they aren't driving anymore. And also assisting and supporting the patient if they decide to speak to their employer in the early stages about any work accommodations. So our recommendations are really powerful in, in these situations, especially if we want to help people feel as functional and as independent as possible and fulfilled as possible as um, they continue their day to day. I want to briefly mention the medications. Although we aren't going to be prescribing any medications, it's still important to know what kind of medications our patients are using so that we know possible side effects and also you know, what they're getting support in. So uh, these medications are going to target a specific symptom. So antipsychotics are used for the involuntary movements or the chorea, and the antidepressant is going to be used for irritability. But if the irritability and mood is a lot more uh, severe, such as severe anger or threatening behavior, then an antipsychotic is likely to be used and an SSRI will be used for obsessive compulsive thoughts. I'm sure I didn't cover everything, but these were the main ones that I've come across during my research. Okay, so that covers everything for Huntington's disease. I hope that this video was helpful. I feel like Huntington's disease is a little more straightforward than a lot of the other conditions. For all of you who are new subscribers to OT Rex and all of your lovely comments, keep them coming, and I will see you guys next time. Take care.